And thank you very much, uh, Bernardo. You are recording. So the blue bar, yes, here's the blue bar. And I want to share my screen. Start broadcast. Two, three, one. And that should work. Now, can you see my screen? Yes, excellent, good, wonderful. So isn't that good when things work? So that's a good starting point. I have to say, I feel a little bit, <laughs> Well, at least spell it with an H at the end. <laughs> I feel a little bit sad because you have been an absolutely fantastic uh, group. I really enjoyed working with you guys. Uh, and I know it has been a roller coaster. Um, yes, uh, the, the for the <laughs> um, this this um, uh, multiple choice is for the bio -eng. The weird thing is that bio -eng students don't take this module, so Fluff knows why there is a multiple choice quiz. So please, if you have done the program level multiple choice quizzes uh, for BI 307 and BI 301, then you are safe. And uh, will you see me next year? Probably not. Because uh, um, I'm only torturing poor, unsuspecting uh, stage one students predominantly. There might be the occasional lecture, but hey, don't you worry. And then uh, probably in the final year, there will be some students who are doing projects with me. No, 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 no. Guys, don't you worry about it. But I'm really pleased that uh, you enjoyed <laughs> uh, I trust, trust me, they, they, are, they are not that great. And I've got loads of colleagues who are so much better uh, with, with the lectures. Uh, so uh, it's, but it has been an enormous pleasure. And as I said, you are going to finish your first year, hopefully in style. Uh, and uh, with the exams. And again, what I said yesterday for the BI 308, this also applies for BI 301. This year in the exam, you have 30 multiple choice quiz uh, questions plus one essay question this year. One essay question. And it could be, you know, uh, pick two inhibitors, compare them. How would you determine the specific activity of an enzyme? Things like that. No, 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 don't, 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 don't. But I hear that somebody is unmuted. And what I want you today, for the next minute or so, I want everybody to unmute themselves, to unmute themselves and give Bernardo a big round of applause for always doing the middle thing. Hey, come on. Fantastic. And now, <laughs> mute yourself again. Um, I will...
provide you with additional support for the uh, for the exams. I will help you uh, if you've got questions. Uh, no, 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 definitely not. Um, um, but it would be great. It would save me a lot of uh, hassle if people have any particular question, if they post them in the uh, Moodle forum. Um, so that I can uh, reply in general and not have to re uh, answer 300 emails coming at three o'clock in the morning. If you post your questions in the Moodle forum, uh, in the discussion forum, uh, I'm very happy to, to answer questions. Makes it so much easier and people then uh, benefit from it because, you know, there might be some questions that uh, other people uh, would like to answer. Right. Now, what I want you to what I want to do with you today is I really want to uh, do a roundup of what we have done. And um, I was told that you were currently doing some insulin stuff in BI 307. Is that right? You have done some insulin. Yep. OK, so what I want to do today is I want to make a link with this module and I want you to show some really, really satisfying stuff when it comes to regulation. It's going to be a little bit of work that we have to do together, but I hope you find that interesting. Right. Let's get started. Right now. If you want to do it together with me, what I suggest is that you leave at least half a page space before you start writing something. Because we need some space up there and we will develop things together. Right now, we discussed in previous lectures. Um, the sort of how we can use glucose as a fuel. And we said the starting point in the liver and in the skeletal muscle is glycogen. So I write glycogen. And I put in bracket an N that means we have a long chain of glycogen, right? And in the liver and in the skeletal muscle, we have a reaction like that, where we chop off glucose 1-phosphate. And I abbreviate it like that, G1P, so glucose 1-phosphate, and we get a shorter chain of glycogen, which I abbreviate as glycogen and in brackets N minus one. This just simply indicates that we use, we, we chop off one glucose molecule, we use phosphate to do that. And this process is called glyco genolysis. That's the, the, the process that uh, happens in the muscle cell. This glucose one phosphate is converted to glucose six phosphate and then it goes into glycolysis. In the liver, the glucose one phosphate is converted to glucose six phosphate. But then this glucose 6-phosphate is dephosphorylated and the glucose is exported into the blood where it uh, maintains the concentration of glucose in the blood to feed uh, all the organs that require glucose for the fuel, like erythrocytes or the brain. So that's the fate of this glucose 1-phosphate. And um, we know that 
This reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase. Phosphorylase. This is the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction, breakdown of glycogen. Glycogen uh, phosphorylase is usually abbreviated as GHP. Hang on, hold your horses, Edith. We are coming to that. GHP, however, can only work when it is phosphorylated. So GHP needs to be phosphorylated to be active. And let's put active in green. So this is the active enzyme. And there is, of course, an inactive form. That's the GHP, which is not phosphorylated. And I indicate that with red. Right now, this reaction is catalyzed. We need some ATP for that, and we transfer the phosphate onto the uh, glycogen phosphorylase. And of course, we can also convert the active phosphorylated GHP back into the inactive form, the GHP. And this is catalyzed by the enzyme protein phosphatase protein phosphatase 1, or also PP1. So who does the conversion of the inactive GHP? Uh, GHP is the same as G... GPH. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. It's the same. Um, but if you say glycogen phosphorylase, uh, then everybody knows what it means. A nice, nice idea, Imogen, protein kinase A. But in this case, it is actually, this reaction is actually uh, catalyzed by an enzyme. Um, which is called um, glycogen, where do I write this? Glycogen phosphorylase, phosphorylase kinase. Yes, to confuse you. This is the reaction. Glycogen phosphorylase kinase catalyzes this reaction. And this enzyme is usually abbreviated as, I need to check, GHP, GHPK, glycogen phosphorylase kinase. But the problem is, guess what? This enzyme, glycogen phosphorylase kinase, has to be phosphorylated. It has to be in the active form. 
it has to be phosphorylated. The inactive form, GHP, that's the inactive form that does not have the phosphate attached. So let's do that as the inactive form doesn't have the phosphate attached. And we do yet another kinase reaction. Again, ATP is transferred and we get ADP. So the, oops, there's a K missing. Here's the K. The uh, glycogen phosphorylase kinase, the inactive form is phosphorylated, becomes phosphorylated, and turns into the active form. Pretty much the same as the glycogen phosphorylase, the same principle. Glycogen phosphorylase, that's my N, that's a, 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 it's an N, not a U. I apologize. Okay, so we have done this. Of course, we can reverse this reaction again. We can dephosphorylate the glycogen phosphorylase kinase. And we remove again the phosphate group. And this again is catalyzed by the reaction PP, by the enzyme PP1. by the protein phosphatase one. Okay, so we can activate glycogen phosphorylase by the enzyme, enzyme glycogen phosphorylase kinase, but it needs to be in the phosphorylated form. How do we get the GHPK phosphorylated? Well, here we meet an old friend. This reaction is catalyzed by, guess who? Does anyone want to hazard a guess? I think Imogen said it earlier. Protein kinase A, yes, absolutely. PKA, that's protein kinase A, which has bound CAMP, cyclic AMP. So here we've got our protein kinase A coming into play, but it has to have CAMP bound. Now, where, otherwise it's not active. Where does the CAMP, the cyclic AMP, come from? Well, we have this PKA plus cyclic AMP. And where does the CAMP come from? Well, it actually is generated by the enzyme adenylate cyclase. Absolutely right. Adenylate cyclase, which produces that, and adenylate cyclase becomes activated by a trimeric G protein, trimeric G protein, and this is activated by Glucagon, that's the hunger hormone. I will put that up on the uh, Teams uh, chart. So don't, uh, on the Teams uh, class files, don't worry about it. And don't worry, that's the end of this cycle. 
how do we actually turn glucagon off in this case? How can we turn glucagon off, the action of glucagon? Well, that's actually not terribly difficult because if we destroy cyclic AMP, if we convert that basically into just AMP, we remove CAMP from the whole thing. That means protein kinase A is no longer active if we take away the CAMP, is no longer active. It can no longer phosphorylate the glycogen phosphorylase kinase. So it goes back into the inactive form. If it is inactive, it can no longer phosphorylate the glycogen phosphorylase. So that goes back into the inactive form. And we don't do any further glycogenolysis. We don't produce any glucose 1 or 6 phosphate. What enzyme does this destruction of CMP? This enzyme is called a phospho phosphodiesterase or PDE. So phosphodiesterase destroys CMP and basically antagonizes the activity of glucagon. It shuts down the glucagon response. Up, down, where do you want me to go? Better? Okay, so we've got the, uh, the phosphodiesterase, PDE, and that antagonizes the function of glucagon. Good, thank you. Um, we can also inactivate PDE this phosphodiesterase, if we want to prolong the glycogen uh, degradation through glucagon, and a very common inhibitor, and I indicate that like that, common inhibitor of PDE, does anyone by any chance know what a very common inhibitor of PDE is? And I guess most of you had use this inhibitor as a sort of a recreational drug. Um, now there are some things that I better should not have asked. I regret having mentioned that. Caffeine. not. I, I would never assume anything like that. So don't stress about it. And I know caffeine is spelled with an E, but I, I ran out of space. So let me write this again. So caffeine. Caffeine. <laughs> yeah, it's a sort of a bit of a car crash. Thank you. <laughs> caffeine inhibits PDE and therefore 
prolongs the action of glucagon. I just thought this is something of interest. Um, I don't know about Viagra. Uh, it could very well be, but that would be a different pathway because it would be a nitro, uh, uh, nitrous oxide pathway in this case. So it could very well be uh, that uh, this uh, goes in there as well, but that's a little bit more complex. So that is the breakdown of glycogen, glycogenolysis. This is this pathway. But of course, oh, PDE5 it says, okay. Caffeine is, an, uh, is a general uh, uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitor. But if you say Viagra, then uh, this would be a very specific one, PDE5. And I actually don't know exactly if uh, PDE5 is expressed in liver or, or skeletal muscle cells. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure about that. So that is how we break down glycogen when we are hungry, when the body needs a glucose or when the muscle uh, needs to do work. Now, of course, we do actually also do the opposite reaction. And for that, we learned that we use UDP glucose. And this reaction would be glycogenesis. Glycogenesis. That's the glycogenesis reaction that we discussed on uh, Wednesday. So it's basically the reverse reaction of glycogenolysis. Glycogenesis uses UDP glucose and adds this UDP glucose to the glycogen and extends the chain. And what is the enzyme that we use for that? Well, we use the enzyme glycogen synthase or GS. So glycogen synthase is responsible for the conversion of gl glycogen to a longer chain of glycogen using UDP. Now, is this regulated? Well, actually, glycogen synthase must be in the phosphorylated form again. So that is the active form, needs to be phosphorylated. No, it's not in the MCQ. It might be in the exam. So we have a phosphorylated glycogen synthase. And of course, we also might have then a dephosphorylated form. So we remove the phosphate group and put that into the inactive form. That can't do anything anymore. So which enzyme can easily uh, dephosphorylate it? Hey, look, it, this is again a reaction catalyzed by protein phosphatase 1 that catalyzes this dephosphorylation. And of course, as you can imagine, we need something that phosphorylates actually this glycogen synthase. So again, we have this reaction here, ATP to 
ADP. And this is catalyzed yet by another kinase. Sometimes it is referred to as GSK, which stands for glycogen synthase kinase or GlaxoSmithKline, which is doesn't stand for, uh, but very often um, people don't refer it as GSK because of the you know misleading things. But this kinase that leads to the phosphorylation of the inactive glycogen synthase is catalyzed. This is only when the GSK is phosphorylized, for, uh, 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 phosphorylated. Any idea what's coming next? Who is going to phosphorylate these things? Actually, for a lot of cells, we don't know this exactly. It is not protein kinase A, because protein kinase A catalyzes this pathway here that leads to glycogenolysis. But we are, we want exactly the opposite we don't want to break down the glycogen. We now want to build it. So we don't want to use protein kinase A. We want to use other kinases. These are other kinases. And there are lots of cell-specific kinases. But these kinases are actually activated activated by, wait for it, wait for it. Eventually they are activated by insulin. Insulin is the hormone of abundance. Insulin tells the body store the glucose that's present in a safe place. Insulin is important for making sure that the fuel stores are replenished. So here the insulin activates a number of kinases and the pathway is rather complex. I always have to look it up myself, so I would not expect you to learn that but uh, it uh, activates a number of kinases which activate glycogen synthase kinase, whatever this is, by phosphorylation, and it then activates glycogen synthase and we store the, glyco the glucose in the glycogen. So here you see that's pretty much what it is. Here you see the two pathways, the, if you like, antagonistic pathways. Glucagon leads to breakdown. Is that enough zoomed out? Glucagon leads to the breakdown, whereas insulin leads to the production. And they have two antagonistic functions. Here's also something interesting. Protein phosphatase PP1 is actually inhibited by PKA, by protein kinase A, and it is activated in the insulin pathway. So 
if you look at it, it makes sense. The pKa converts the glycogen phosphorylase into the inactive form. And we don't want this to happen when we want to break down glycogen. So pKa inhibits the inhibitor, if you like, whereas insulin activates the inhibitor. Okay, wow, that was, that was a ride. Uh, I discussed uh, with my wife whether I should show you, whether I should go through this scheme with you. Uh, and I thought, you know, that's, it's quite challenging. But I thought, well, I, I think I can do that with you guys. So insulin activates, uh, blah, blah, blah. insulin activates glycogen production. It also has an influence on lipogenesis. It activates lipogenesis. So it activates the production of uh, fatty acids. What is the target? The target is the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which produces acetyl-CoA. So insulin activates the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. We produce acetyl-CoA. This acetyl-CoA then in the lipogenesis is converted into malonyl-CoA. Let me write this properly. Malonyl-CoA. And that was one of the key steps in the generation of fatty acids. Absolutely right. That is where the, the liver activity comes from. Malonyl-CoA, that is catalyzed by acetyl-CoA. Carboxylase. And again, it's a phosphorylation reaction that activates the enzyme. Let me do it like that, so that makes it active. And also this enzyme is active. And that generates more malonyl-CoA, which can be used for production of fatty acids. And there's also something interesting. This malonyl-CoA inhibits, and I draw it like that, malonyl-CoA inhibits the carnitin acyl carrier. What is this carrier doing, carnitin acyl carrier? Can you remember that? What is the carnitin acyl carrier doing? And I can see Google is working overtime. Yes, it is important for the beta oxidation. It basically transports the uh, fatty acids fatty acids into the mitochondria. This is essential and only in the mitochondria we then can do the beta oxidation. But if we've got lots of malonyl-CoA, This will block this process, so we stop lipolysis. We stop the breakdown of fatty acids. 
because it wouldn't make sense. On one hand, we produce the fatty acids. On the other hand, we it wouldn't make sense then to break them down immediately. That would be wasteful. So with insulin, we drive it into lipogenesis. Without insulin, we go into lipolysis. And you see how this is a really nicely regulated system. Does that make sense to you guys? And again, I zoom out a little bit. Don't know if that helps. So that is what insulin does. But then you see, where does the insulin come from? How does the body know that it has to generate insulin? Where does insulin come from? And I know you have done that in BI307. So which cells produce insulin? Absolutely right. It's the beta cells in the Langerhans islets in the pancreas. So how do these cells actually know that they have to secrete insulin. Let's have a look. Let's say we have a beta cell here. That's our beta cell. So you've discussed the calcium influx in BI307? No. Ah, okay. So that was just that was just speculation. Okay, let's have a look what happens. Okay, we have lots of glucose. Lots of glucose, and I write it like that. Glucose is transported into cells through glucose transporters. And in the beta cell, we have the glucose transporters, and I indicate it like that. These are GLUT2 transporters. They are glucose transporters. So the glucose goes in. Remember, these GLUT2 transporters have a, not a very high affinity. So they have low relatively low affinity, low affinity for glucose. So you need to have a relatively high concentration of glucose in the blood before these GLUT2 transporters spring into action. So, but let's assume we just had our uh, full English, lots of glucose, uh, there's lots of uh, glucose in the blood, and the GLUT2 transporters transport the glucose in. Immediately, we keep the glucose safe by transferring it into glucose 6-phosphate, and glucose 6-phosphate goes down the route of glycolysis. Glycolysis. And of course, we increase the level of ATP. So our ATP levels in the pancreas go up. So far, so good. Are you still with me? ATP levels up when we have lots of glucose, just simply because we do glycolysis. Right. The next step, what happens is that pancreas cells, let me use a different color for that. Oh yes, pink, pink is good. They also have what is called potassium channels. Potassium channels, and they are ATP sensitive. So what happens? Usually, these potassium channels are open. And 
what they do is they transport potassium out. So we have potassium sitting outside. What is the consequence of transporting potassium out in terms of charge? What would be the charge outside of the cell if we transport lots of potassium out? Absolutely right. We get positive charges out there. Right? And as a consequence, we get negative charges in there. This means our membrane here, we call this, is polarized. So, under normal circumstances, the membrane is polarized, positive outside, negative inside. Now, when we get ATP, let me use another color, oh yeah, blue. When we get ATP, ATP blocks these channels. ATP block. These channels can no longer transport potassium outside. What happens to the membrane? Yes. We get, we get depolarization. This means the outside becomes less positive. The inside becomes more positive or less negative, if you like. So the, we have less positive charges outside because it, they, they are going back in. Right? So we have a depolarization of the membrane. Now, this depolarization, depolarization, this depolarization, this change in the polarity leads to an activation of calcium channels. So we also have now calcium channels in the membrane. They are usually closed. They are calcium channels. Usually they are closed. But if the membrane becomes depolarized, Calcium moves in. So that is calcium influx. So calcium influx. So glucose goes in, produces ATP. ATP closes the potassium channels, the membrane becomes depolarized, activates the calcium channel, calcium flows in. So what? What we have in the beta cells, we have preformed vesicles that are sitting under the cell membrane. These preformed vesicles contain insulin. Plus another protein called amylin. 
the ratio is about 100 to 100 insulin, one amylin. These vesicles are sitting there. They have sort of little receptors on the vesicle, and there are also receptors on the cell membrane, out uh, inside. But these receptors cannot interact with each other, only, they can only interact when they have calcium in there. And if they have calcium, They can interact and insulin is released plus amylin. Both are peptide hormones. Insulin is released, goes into the bloodstream. It moves into the bloodstream and in the bloodstream, then we go up there where the insulin does all the things. It activates lipogenesis and it activates the glycogenesis. Now, what is this amylin? Good question. What is amylin? Amylin, we don't know a lot about exactly how it works. It's also a peptide hormone. Peptide hormone. Amylin inactivates the production. Now, wait for it. This is pure genius. It inactivates the production of. Are you ready for this? Has nothing to do with amylase. Amylin. inactivates the production of glucagon. Isn't that poor genius? When we produce insulin, we don't want glucagon to hang around because they both have totally opposite effects. So glucagon needs to be shut off and we shut this off by the co-secretion of amylin with insulin. Now, if our glucose levels are going down, the GLUT2 transporters no longer transport glucose into the beta cell. The ATP levels go down a little bit. The ATP does not block the potassium channels anymore. We polarize the cells. The calcium channels close and the vesicles with the insulin amylin can no longer fuse with the cell membrane. No more insulin goes out. No more amylin goes out. Amylin does not block and inactivate the production of glucagon. And glucagon wins. And the level of insulin goes down. How amazing is this? If you think about that, this regulation is just mind blowing. So this is basically just one part of how these two pro, uh, peptide hormones, glucagon and insulin, actually work as sort of antagonists I, I I don't actually know, but I tell you what it is. I will task you with coming up with a sort of a mnemonic for that, a fun song, something rude, and I would love to see 
what people come up so that they can remember that. Now, we have done a whistle to a stop through biochemistry, through metabolic pathways. I'm fully aware that we have not had time to cover everything. I hope, however, that I've given you a little bit of an idea of how things can work together, starting from the enzymes, starting from regulation of enzymes, to what I would consider fairly complex pathways here. And uh, of course, as I said, we have not covered everything. By, by wide stretch of uh, imagination, we have just scratched the surface. But I hopefully, uh, I, gave, I could give you a sort of a sense of the beauty, how things are actually linked together, how they interlink, how pathways interlink. And if at one point in the hopefully not too distant future, we understand actually how these things really work together, then we will be in a position to cure very complicated metabolic diseases like diabetes. On that note, you will learn more about diabetes next year in the metabolism uh, module. And I just simply say thank you very much for listening. I will put the, the, the diagram up on, on, the, on the charts. And uh, all I can say is good luck for the exams and keep up the good work. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Mic drop. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. I think now I need a drink.